All right. Welcome, everybody, to the Sigma webinar of the week. We're going to be covering unions, cohort analysis, as well as materializations. I'm here. To, I'm Zach Norton. I'm joined by Travis Benson, and we're going to actually get started in just a couple moments because I'm seeing the attendees list is still ticking up. So we'll let everybody get settled in, and then we'll begin in earnest. But just FYI, we'll be recording this session. So if you do get up, grab a bite to eat or miss anything, or you want to circle back and follow along with the demo within your trial instance, you'll get a recording sent to you via email after this session. So just going to wait a couple moments and then we'll begin. All right, looks like the attendees list is leveling off. So let's begin. This session is going to be combining unions, cohorts, analysis, and materialization like you've never seen it before. Nobody's ever tried to do it this way. So this is going to be a fun session, a little bit more of a Sigma 102. So kind of jumping into the deep end for folks that are just getting introduced to us the first time. Myself, I'm Zach Norton. I'm a technical product marketing manager at Sigma. I'll be moderating this session, so if you have any questions, feel free to pop them into the GoToWebinar question panel. And I'm joined today by Travis Benson. He is one of our solution engineers at Sigma, and he's going to be able to take you through unions, cohort analysis, as well as materialization. So just to get a feel for our audience today, I'm going to launch a poll just to find out what is your familiarity with Sigma. So if you look at the GoToWebinar, I'm going to collect some responses. Just give everybody a couple more seconds to find the poll tab and post a response. Okay, and I'm gonna close this and share the results. And what we have here is, looks like some folks are completely new. So I will set the stage for an introduction to Sigma, what we're all about. It's also nice to remind our existing customers what we think we're special uh, in or where we think we differentiate. And uh, because most of the audience is Sigma customers, I think that's great. That's actually very useful for what will be covered today, which will be focused on actually a little bit more of a 102 presentation focused on cohort analysis and some of the other features that you may not know is available within Sigma and how you can level up your analysis to get into some enrichment of data sets using the unionization as well as we're going to circle back and just have a general Q&A about materialization and certain best practices there. Now for people that are net new to Sigma what we are is a next-gen cloud analytics tool for the modern data stack. Now, that is a handful of buzzwords, so the way I like to put it is think of us more like the Jetsons than the Flintstones, because we have never been on-premise. We have always been in the cloud. We have no prehistoric on-premise baggage, and we are a software-as-a-service company built specifically for cloud data warehouses like Snowflake, Redshift, BigQuery, Databricks. That is a primary differentiator for us, just that we were born on the cloud for those platforms and that unique scalability. Next major thing for us is that we have an intuitive spreadsheet experience that scales with your cloud data warehouse. So our approach to analytics was to take Excel-like interactions. When you make those manipulations on those tabular formats that you'll see today, all that creates is machine-generated SQL code that gets pushed down directly to the cloud data warehouse. So what we'll share today is a pretty dramatic example of analysis that is not easy to do within SQL. Um, for large amounts of data, it's not easy to do even on desktop Excel or even really possible to do from a business perspective in a traditional BI tool. So speaking of traditional BI tools, if you already have a BI standard, a lot of times we come in as complementary. So keep your existing reports in Tableau, business objects, 
uh, Cognos, wherever it exists already, and then use Sigma for new cloud workloads that you want to rapidly prototype, that you want to do more analysis on, uh, that's a little bit more advanced, like the cohort analysis you'll see today. And the last thing I want to touch upon is that we are brought to you by the same people that brought you Snowflake. So Mike Spizer, Snowflake's first CEO, managing director over at Sutter Hill Ventures, we are his next move. So after scoring the largest tech IPO of all time, he tries to figure out how can I top that? Well, Sigma will now be the front end for cloud data warehouses like Snowflake, but then also he has a larger total addressable market because we're gonna to connect to Postgres or Redshift or BigQuery as well as Databricks. And the interface that we provide is the Sigma workbook. So that workbook connects live and secure on your cloud data warehouse. I always emphasize that if you are evaluating Sigma, you've seen a demo, you're starting to get familiar with us, we don't move or hold any of your data. So it makes people like Travis, his job a lot easier going through security reviews that hey, you already approved Snowflake or BigQuery or Redshift or Databricks. The data is going to stay there. What we're going to do is prevent your business users from exporting into Excel because they'll be able to perform things like cohort analysis, build pivot tables with a familiar spreadsheet experience. They can add their additional ad hoc formulas and calculations, drill anywhere into the data. And it's all going to scale as opposed to the use cases where Hey, you did all your data prep for the Cloud Data Warehouse, and now you're going to have to shatter that into a bunch of different Excel sheets and then hand it off to your business users and then constantly repeat that same motion. So instead, we're going to scale, and everything we show today is completely embeddable. So if you want to embed it in Salesforce, in an internal portal, or maybe you are doing some cohort analysis on behalf of your customers and you want to embed that in a portal for them to be able to see all the advanced work that you've done on their data that is a common use case for Sigma. We have 400 plus customers, including very large global brands like US Foods. I'm based in New York, so I worked a lot with financial tech companies like Blackstone and Cowan. Um, Travis is out on the West Coast, so he's probably talking to folks like Prologis as well as everybody else in Silicon Valley. Now, I'm gonna actually launch one more poll and this is just to kind of get a feel for what folks are most interested in today. So we're going to tie all three of these together, the unions, how that's going to enable the cohort analysis, and how we're going to provide materialization afterwards. So some of the cool stuff is the way it all ties together, but I'd like to get an idea of what we should focus most of this presentation on. All right, not too much love for materialization here. I'm gonna close the poll, actually share the results. So I think what will be interesting is we're gonna show the union as just some quick data prep, where it lies within the tool, and then a lot of this is gonna be on the cohort analysis. What's great is the data set that Travis is going to present on is also available in your Sigma sample database. So we're gonna follow this up with a recording via email, and you can, after seeing Travis perform this analysis, that same sample data set is sitting within the sample database. So if you wanted to repeat the same actions, that'd be almost a fun kind of hands-on lab that you can follow up with. So high level, unions are a new feature within our tool. It's in beta, but it works like it's already in production. And it's akin to a SQL union operator. So essentially just putting one table on top of another. Uh, what's useful here is it's very easy to do it within Sigma and it's dramatized immediately to see if you performed it correctly. Uh, one of the things that I like most about Sigma's interface is that if you make a mistake or do a goofy join or a goofy filter, you're going to know very quickly because the data is presented in a very easy to understand tabular format. So with those unions, what we'll see today is Travis will tie together two different sales transaction tables. Uh, other use cases often end up being combining sales and inventory if you want to do some more of like a stock analysis. And another place we often see this is within the healthcare vertical, where Sigma's great because we don't persist the data, so we pass HIPAA compliance very easily. And then what we need to do is help those actual clinicians be able to analyze the data sitting within the cloud data warehouse. And what oftentimes they need to do is hop across multiple different fact tables, like looking at patient ID, 
but then look at that patient, what prescriptions they have, how that overlaps with their medications or different observations in these very large tables. So unioning ends up being very handy within Sigma, and you'll see how easy it is to onboard and understand the feature today. And cohort analysis, we're gonna take you through an example that'll be time-based. We're gonna calculate retention rates for a company called Paper Cream. So think of it almost like a Best Buy, different transactions. Uh, cohort analysis, it's hard to do on large data sets without knowing SQL. And what we're gonna show you is how we make it simpler by allowing the prep, getting the data arranged, trusting the data, then taking spreadsheet interactions to be able to do things like cross-level calculations without having to go to night school and learn DAX or have to figure out level of detail cal calculations like in Tableau. We make it a lot easier to set up, perform those last minute final enrichments and get to an actual pivot table that we can embed anywhere for your business users. So that is me teeing up everything for Travis. I'm gonna make you presenter now. Let me make awesome. sure. Awesome, thank you, Zach. Travis. Looks like I should be showing my screen right now. Hopefully everybody can see this. Looks good. All right, floor is yours. Awesome. Um, just to do a quick introduction of myself for everybody on the phone here. First and foremost, thanks for taking the time out of your busy day to uh, listen to Zach and I present a little bit about what Sigma can do and, and how we help teams with cohort analysis and mostly. Um, I, I'm Travis. I've worked in the business intelligence space for about four years. I was a BI manager. Um, and then I recently was a solutions consultant, solutions engineer over at a, a bespoke product analytics company called Heap Analytics. Uh, I really spent a lot of time analyzing user behavior. Um, so there's a lot of similar use cases with that, especially managing retention or understanding retention of clients um, as well. So that's a little intro to myself. I'm based in the Bay Area, uh, mostly work with San Francisco based companies or, or Silicon Valley. Uh, but the first thing I want to start with is, I'm just going to pop this in the full screen here, is, or, sorry, I'll undo that really quickly, is I want to just talk about the homepage. For those of you who have never seen a demo of Sigma, uh, I know there was probably 11 or 12% or of you on the call. This is essentially what you're going to see when you log into Sigma for the first time. You'll notice that everything is browser-based. Paper Crane is the name of the account that we're exploring today. That's one of our demo environments. And like Zach said, Paper Crane is very similar to you know uh, a traditional retailer such as Best Buy or Ross Stores or, or some retailer where you go to buy items. Now I'm going to pull this into full screen really quickly, and on the left hand side you'll see navigation that is going to basically resemble navigation that you would see in a traditional file system. So you can think of Google Docs, you can think of Google Drive, or even you know your local file system on your Mac or PC that you're using. Now you'll see the recent documents that I've been working on. You'll see existing documents that might be popular for my team, as well as you'll see some data sets that people are working off of. Now on the left-hand side, you'll also see uh, a My Documents folder as well as a Workspace folder. The data that I want to work with today actually exists within our webinar content workspace and then inside of cohort analysis. Now I have four documents here. We have uh, a complete cohort analysis. We have a data set that has our transactions from 2020 to present, and then historical transactions. We'll union those together, as well as we have a blank worksheet that I'm basically going to build this cohort analysis complete. So I like to start off with the complete cohort analysis to get everybody acclimated with what is the information that we're actually looking at today. Um, and you'll see here that it pops me into this tabular like interface. So in this tabular-like interface, like Zach said earlier, we have historical transactions and we have present transactions. You'll see order numbers and the product type and the store in which it was sold at. And then we also are going to create this union. So we'll create a union and we'll enrich this union to ultimately perform cohort analysis. So I know this is really common to analyze sales data. Let's say you're an e-commerce company and you're selling a product that's supposed to be bought you know, every three weeks, you'd like to see uh, higher retention rates because you're influencing repeat purchase behavior. And this is traditionally how people look at retention in this kind of triangular form. You'll see you have an acquisition month of a customer, and then you have the month since joining. And one thing that we can just see kind of right out of the gate here is that late in 2021, 
we had some cohorts of users that had relatively low retention, and this is something that we probably want to dive into. So the idea of the demo is basically to build this from the ground up and hopefully help you all be able to do this on your own data sets uh, or to show you the part of the possible within Sigma. So I'm gonna go back and we'll first start by going back into the workspaces. So I'll go to the webinar content and then I'm gonna go into my unions, cohorts and materialization. So this is the bare bones workbook and your workbooks basically are where you're gonna do most of your analysis within Sigma, you can think of, we can put charts and graphs on here. But the first thing that I wanna call folks' attention to is that these workbooks look and feel very much like Excel. You'll see we have a tabular interface here. This specific historical transactions record has about 1.6 million rows. So we'd already be past the limits of what Excel could handle in this one transaction sheet. That's kind of the beauty of working with Sigma and working natively in the cloud is you know, we can scale up to hundreds of billions of rows, just depending on warehouse sizing that you size your warehouses with. And then we also have transactions 2020 to present. One quick thing I can do in a really, really useful trick within Sigma is on any column, I can quickly take a look at the column details and I'll get some really interesting information within here. Most importantly, I wanna focus on my minimum and maximum statistics. You'll notice that the minimum date of purchase I have is the uh, is July 17th or July 15th, 2018. And the maximum date is year end of 2019 in this specific table. And then on this table, if I do the exact same thing, I can go ahead and look at the column details. Our minimum date is 2020 and our maximum date is 2022. These are at the same data set. You'll notice the columns are the same. And basically as a business user, I want to basically merge these things together. So if you're familiar with using Excel, you're probably just gonna hit Command A or copy one of these entire sheets and then simply paste it in the other sheet. Um, that would work for most data sets, but a data set of this size, Excel simply can't handle that workload. So within SQL and the folks that understand SQL, an easy way to accomplish this is simply a union statement. And something that Zach talked about earlier is the beauty of Sigma is that you don't have to understand SQL. We're trying to meet our users where they are. So we're trying to meet business users uh, in the Excel interface that they know and love. And we'll kind of show you how we just merge these two data sets together. So I am not in edit mode right now, but I can jump into edit mode here. And I'm gonna get a couple more things that I'm able to do. So the first thing that I, I wanna do is I wanna name this page, the data page. And I can just add that here in the bottom, and then I'll add one new page which is gonna be our union page. So this is gonna be very similar to Excel if you have multiple sheets in an Excel file. And what I wanna do is I want to add a new element, which is gonna be a table, but it'll be the union of two tables. So I'll hit new over here, and then I can hit this union button. It's in beta, as Zach said earlier, but does work relatively well. And what I can do is I can grab these data sets. So I can grab transactions historical, I'm gonna select all the columns. If you wanted to deselect them, you totally could do that as well, but I will select them all. I'll hit select, and then that's gonna be my first source, but I need to add one more, which is my transactions from 2020 to present. Same thing here. I'm gonna add all my columns. I'll hit select. Sigma is gonna do its best to auto match the column names or column headers. If you want to change these, let's say you called SKU number a different thing in your other table, you could go ahead and change that here. But these all match up perfectly. And then I'm just gonna preview this output. And this is an important thing to do in Sigma is just to get a feel for, you know, how is this merge actually gonna work? We'll once again, go to the date column. We'll hit column details. And in the column details, we can now see that our minimum date of this data set is 2018 and our maximum date is 2022. So we've actually done what we expected to do. So let's go ahead and hit done. And now what we're looking at is just one flat table for these two tables, exact same data. And it's important to note that you simply couldn't do this union in Excel because there is too much data. Awesome, so this is our union of transaction data. I'm just gonna go ahead and edit this. Perfect. So now that we're doing retention analysis, we're gonna start interacting with this workbook. And one of the really nice things about Sigma is we can basically interact with this table very much like we would in the sheet or Excel. 
So the first thing that I want to do is I want to look at monthly retention. So I know I have this date column, but I need to change the format of this date. So the easiest way to do that in Sigma is click on this caret, create a duplicate column, and then we'll call this month of transaction. So TRX for short. And I'm going to truncate this date down to a monthly grain. Perfect. So now I have that. The next thing that I want to do is I want to figure out how many customers purchased an item for each individual month. So in order to do that, the first thing I need to do is I need to group this data set by our customer key or customer name would be the same. So I'll go ahead and group this by customer key. And these queries that you see running across the top are just queries that are being sent to Snowflake. So this is just, you can think of this as a front end where we're basically machine generating all the SQL in the back end, sending it to Snowflake and it's returning us these values. So we have 4.7 million rows. I'll collapse this customer key. And we have about 5,000 clients. That's what this is representing is about 5,000 unique clients. So I'll expand this one more time. And to do retention, we have to figure out when was the first date in which somebody bought a product. Now, me coming from a product analytics background, you could do retention analysis with product analytics as well. You could understand, you know, after a user logs in, what's their retention rate? How likely are they to come back into your app over time? This is obviously something that Sigma does and software companies, SaaS companies are very, very keen to understand this metric. But we're, we're gonna be doing it for purchases today. So the first thing that I'll do is I'm gonna add one new column and it's gonna pop me into this formula bar that's gonna be really similar to Excel. So if I type in sum, you'll notice we have sums and some ifs and all different types of functions that are included in this fun function index. But what we want to find is we want to find the minimum of our month transaction date. So what this will do is it's gonna return the first month for each customer in which they bought a product. So if I collapse this really quickly, You'll see that each customer key has a corresponding month of first purchase, and these will change for every single customer. Awesome. The next thing that I want to do is really similar to a fill down in Excel. So I basically want to duplicate this table, but for every single order number and date, I want the customer key and the minimum month of their transaction, or I can just change this to first purchase date. First purchase date. And how I'll do that is I'll just create a child element. I'll create another table off this table. And what we've really done there is just simply filling down all that data. So now we have the customer key. You can think of this as customer name. And then their first date should be the same for every customer key. You'll notice that for 2068, the first purchase date is always going to be uh, July 2018. Awesome. So the next thing that we want to do in this is we want to basically group on the first purchase date. So that way we can see how many customers purchased within each first purchase date month. So what I'll do here is I will group on this column. And when I group on this column, it's gonna send that query down to Snowflake like we saw earlier. For anybody who's really SQL savvy on the line, you can always at any time take a look at the query history and actually get down into the granular SQL. This can be really useful for data engineering teams um, if they wanna understand how to regenerate the SQL, but this is all being computed by Sigma on the back end. This is basically the level of work that we're abstracting away from the users in order for them to interact in an Excel-like fashion. So now that we've calculated or grouped by the first purchase date, the next thing that we want to do is we want to understand how many customers purchased a product in this month. So once again, we'll add another column here and we'll call this number of customers, number of customers. And here, what I need to do is I need to do account distinct. I need to find the number of unique customers that have actually purchased in this month. So I'll just do account distinct of customer key. And when I grab that, it's gonna tell me on July, 2018, how many customers actually bought my product for the first time. 
So we'll let that query run. And we have 2,944 customers. I could collapse this again, like you saw earlier, and we'll see all of the purchases for all of the months. Great. Now, the next thing that we have to do, and this is kind of where Zach said we're getting into the 102 of, of Sigma, is we're going to do a multi-level grouping here. So we have one grouping level so far, but Sigma can support many levels of grouping. And then we can do calculations across those levels. So the next thing that we want to do is we want to group by the month of transaction. So if we group by this column, we're also going to do another count distinct of customers in that month. So we'll do count distinct customer key. And once this computes, we'll see for each month how many customers came back and purchased an item. So we can call this returning customers. And then we will call this new customers just to change our names. And so you'll notice in the first month, when the months match, the new customers and returning customers equal the same value. That's to be expected. But if we go ahead and collapse this month of transaction, you will notice that the returning customers slowly go down. That's what's going to give us that triangle graph that you see, uh, that you saw in that visualization that I showed you earlier. We're not quite done yet. We have to add a few more things, but you will notice as I'm doing this, I'm really just using Excel based formulas and they're just happening. All the SQL is just being written in the back end for me. The next thing that I want to do is basically a cross level calculation. For those of you that are familiar with SQL, You'll notice that this will be uh, one grouping and then a subquery with a grouping level. And we're going to divide across those things. Excel users, really all they want to know is they just want to divide this number by this number and don't really want to understand you know, what's going on in the SQL behind the scenes. So we make that real easy. I can add a column here and we can call this our retention rate. Rate. And retention rates, relatively simple. We're just going to take our returning customers and we're going to divide those over our new customers. And that's going to give us a retention rate. You'll notice that the retention rate is one or 100% in the first month because the user obviously bought a product. So they're a returning customer, but it falls over time. Great. The last thing that I want to figure out and that we'll need for the visualization is how many months since their first purchase did pass essentially. So what we'll do here is we'll add one more new column and we'll just say months since purchase. And to find the delta here, we're going to take the, sorry, I will undo that. To find the delta here, we'll just do a date diff formula. So if I type in date diff, that's gonna calculate the time difference between two dates. The unit that we're gonna use is gonna be month. And then the start date will be our first purchase date, and the end date will be our month of transaction. And then this will give us the dates, the months since our first purchase. Awesome. So at this point, we've done all the data massaging and modeling that we need to do to basically create a pivot table to show us this retention graph. Now, in order to complete this analysis, what I can do is I can create a child element off of this data set. And I'm going to use a pivot table. Everybody likes using pivot tables. Pivot tables in Sigma are really easy to build. And th the first thing that we need is in the columns, we're going to need the months since first purchase. So we can grab those months and we can overlay them on the top here. And then we need the first purchase date in our rows. And then we just need to plot that retention rate in the values of the pivot table. I'm going to change this from a sum to an average aggregate. And once I do that, this is kind of hard for me to parse through. It's, uh, I can't really tell many trends in here. Something that we like to do in almost all of our pivot tables is we like to apply conditional formatting. So if I go into conditional formatting here, I could add in the color scale. And I think this one really pops. Now, what is this graph actually showing us? That's probably the most important thing of any analysis that you do in Sigma is, is really trying to understand the business value of what you're analyzing. Now, anytime where we see these dark colors or dark lines, that means our retention rate is relatively low. So in the four months at the end of 2018,
we had relatively low retention rate compared to most of the other months. And then you'll see it once again, we also had a pretty low retention rate um, towards the latter half of 2021. So this might be something that will prompt a business user to go in a little bit deeper and understand, you know, what types of products were these folks purchasing? Um, can we send marketing campaigns to these folks to basically increase these retention rates over time? One thing I might do to clean this up is just add a simple filter on here for the previous year. So I'll just go to the last year. And it's gonna just kind of make this retention graph a little bit shorter. And you'll notice this looks very similar to what Zach calculated. Awesome, so that's that's how you can do cohort analysis within Sigma. Now, if you had, if you're on the business side and you want to basically activate this data, a really simple way to activate it would be to go into these dates of first purchase and look at the underlying information. So if I wanted to show the underlying data below here, I could start to see who are these customers. If I added in that customer, the customer name, I could get a list of those folks. I could email them. I could have my data science team or data engineering team use other tools that I might use in my business to help reach out to these folks and try to drive more repeat purchases from these cohorts. Great, the last thing that I wanted to show, and it won't take very long, is I wanted to talk about materialization. So materialization is basically a way for you to speed up your queries within Sigma. If you have a lot of complex joins that are happening, this is primarily focused for folks on the data engineering teams. Um, you can actually materialize data sets within Sigma. So let's say I wanted this transactions historical data set to run a little bit faster and have the joins pre-computed. I could go here, I could do you know, some simple formatting. If I hit edit here, do some simple formatting. Maybe I wanted to do a date trunk here if I added a new column on this worksheet. I could go ahead, duplicate the column and do that same date trunk that we did by week, for example. Obviously, you can do much more complex logic here. You could do joins, you could do unions, uh, cross joins, any type of any type of manipulation of this data set that you want to do. But you can go over to the materialization tab, create a schedule here, and then basically have all of those pre-computed uh, queries and operations be pushed up into your data warehouse on some cadence. And then your end users will be querying off that table. And that's going to save you quite a bit on your consumption cost in Snowflakes, as well as it's gonna speed up the time to run these queries. So that is basically all I had to present today. Zach, I will kick it back over to you. All right, so Travis, that was excellent. Uh, thanks for walking through that. I think that is a really great resource, especially for everybody on the line. If you wanna watch the recording and follow Travis's click path, that's as clean as it gets. So I'm gonna put up this Q&A slide for now because I know there has to be a handful of questions, but we did get a few while we were walking through the presentation. Uh, one thing that came up was what if the tables are different formats before the union? So one thing that Sigma is great about is we actually have the ability to parse JSON. So even if some of the data was still in JSON format, we can actually come in, extract columns, pluck them out. And I did that quickly. That was just a right click on that nested JSON field and selecting to extract. So if that was something I wanted to do, clean up the data as I'm getting started, I can then add the new table with the union, one on top of the other. And as you saw Travis do, he was able to select, hey, I wanna match this column with this column. You can actually Sigma takes a guess, but then you can fine tune it for some of those Second, joins. another thing that you could show too for whoever asked that question is that you have the ability to change the formats of, of or the types of data within Sigma. So if Zach were to go onto some field, he could basically change the uh, or transform it into a number. You can see logical or JSON. So this would help you basically massage the data into the correct formats that you need. Good point. And just the click path, I wanna show, uh, to get to that union, what we did was we added another element. What we wanted to do was create a table that would union these two together. So we select table. And then the last bit is you do have to select this new tab. So once you select the new tab, that's where union lies. And another little click shortcut is, let's say I'm starting with this table. I can actually select from down here that I want to union. 
and I'm going to point to the next data set, and then it keys them right up for you. So rather than having this like this table, this table, if you begin with one of the tables and then select union from the bottom left hand corner, that's another way to quickly stack them right on top of each other. Okay. All right, incremental materialization. One of the questions, materializing, materialization can be expensive if it's a big table. How do we do incremental? Now, with unions, we're actually pretty opened up for this now. So you might have, I had this one customer and they had 100 billion rows of, I think they were individual cell phone numbers. So they're doing actually cohort analysis across that many rows of data and they had to go across a large amount of time. And what they did was they layered over first a kind of like 2020 to 2022 row of data that was materialized. Then they union on top of that kind of layers of materialization for kind of up to August. And then it would have been from August to September was the last layered piece that they were stacking one on top of the other. So a little detail that I wanna share for where Sigma is heading is right now materialization is within data sets. Soon we would have materialization in workbooks. So once Travis hit the end point where he's created this 1200 row amounted analysis crunching on the 4.5 million rows, he can schedule that materialization. Then what you would do is union that with the more recent cut of data that is uh, more for like the last 30 days. So go ahead, you have the materialization for the previous compute, but then with the union and capability, we'd be able to scale out for getting those queries to be even cheaper for you and not have to be run as often. And that also goes into the next question, um, way for end users to force a refresh if more data is needed. So this is right now within our staging environment, we have new features, we put them in our staging just to do the last line of troubleshooting. Folks like Travis and the other Sigma solution engineers get on top of it and give feedback. But this is how we're gonna actually move that materialization closer to the business users, get them more hands-on with being able to schedule hit refresh for when they wanna be able to get at that data. Now, that being said, you still have the option to prevent the business users from getting that functionality. So if it's something you wanna still keep almost behind a line of demarcation for just the BI team or the data team, you have the ability to have granular permissions for those end users that they would not have the ability to perform that materialization. And one last question is, when will we have materialization alongside an OAuth connection? That is one that I still have to defer to some of our product team. Uh, I'll reach back out with an answer, but that's also something that makes sense to usually have a quick call with a Sigma solution engineer and just figure out some of the best practice approach for, uh, this is how we're gonna do materialization with a one of our uh, Snowflake connections, and this is gonna be the OAuth connection that is gonna be more for those um, business users that won't have the permission to be able to do that right back. Okay, I think that's all I'm seeing right now for questions. So that means that I can do some quick plugs for what's coming up. As we were saying, uh, we have the ability to embed everything that you saw today. So that is one of our next sessions, which is accelerating time to value with embedded analytics in Sigma. So some best practices, what you can do with our user-backed embedding. And that can be for Salesforce, external portals, really allowing your business users to be able to drill anywhere within Sigma as opposed to building tens and hundreds of different dashboards for their one-off requests. We'll also have another virtual hands-on lab, September 27th. But what I would say is because we're sharing the recording of this session, if you want to pick up within your own Sigma trial after the point that Travis performed that union, when you log into a Sigma trial, you'll have a connection that is a Sigma sample database. And then if you navigate to this plugs electronics, hands-on lab data table, 
and select explore, this will pretty much pick up where we would start doing the truncation of date down to month for month of transaction and then grabbing that customer key and doing some of the analysis that you saw here today. So that might be a fun one to just do a quick breeze through following the actual recording of this session being sent out. Aside from that, there is also our hands-on lab, which will take you through kind of like an A to Z, building out more of a visualization-based workbook. And as always, October 6th, we will have our monthly What's New in Sigma webinar, led by John Avrak, one of our head evangelists. He'll be able to show you all the new features that have been launched in the tool over the past, I think it's been a little bit more of a stretch between last webinar sets in the past 30 days. So thank you everybody for attending this session. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Keep a lookout for that follow-up email. And uh, Travis, thanks for taking us through such a clean demonstration of cohort analysis. Thank you all, thanks everybody for your time. Um, we're super excited to show you all Sigma. We're pretty excited about the tool. So uh, hopefully maybe I'll be working with some of you in the future. Nice to meet you all. All right, that's a wrap. Take care, everybody.